Hey, thank you for coming. Good evening. I'm Georges Legendre. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome this audience tonight, and of course a pleasure to welcome uh, Bernard Cash back to the AA tonight. Um, since basically 1995, when Earth Moves was um, published, Bernard has been at the forefront of a particular sort of, a, a, let's say, aspect of our discipline. Um, it's sort of, if you like, the uh, is at the forefront of a sort of, let's say, geometric and computational ontology, or let's say, uh, issues of computation and obviously geometry as they pertain basically to the development of our discipline. And he's been very much at the forefront, essentially, uh, through both publications. He's a very prolific writer, uh, which I'll maybe elaborate on a little bit uh, later, as well as obviously in practice uh, with Patrick Bosset as part of the uh, collective group, Paris-based collective group Objectil, which has been incredibly active um, in the last 10, 15 years uh, in the areas of uh, basically industrial projects in uh, basically the domain of, let's say, non-standard uh, components and architectural sort of uh, design. And I would let obviously Bernard explain the term non-standard himself. Uh, Bernard, as I mentioned, is a prolific writer, obviously starting with Earth Moves, which um, whose title in English doesn't quite render the uh, grace of the uh, French original, which is uh, Terre Meuble, as well as um, a number of publications, Architecture Experimentale, a uh, catalog uh, from the Orléans-based, uh, basically, uh, Architecture Frac Center, as well as now, last year, the publication of the so-called Brouillon Project with Patrick Bosset, uh, edited uh, by Springer in Wien, which is a, a basically a monography of, of the practices last a few years. Bernard is also a teacher. He's held positions both at the Berlage uh, in Holland, as well as in Toronto and uh, in Barcelona, I believe. Um, he's a basically world travel teacher with numerous hands in various schools and programs. Bernard is in many ways very well known and I'd say even a little bit of a mystery uh, to those who know him a little bit better. For instance, we all know him as a theorist, an architect, uh, someone who's had a tremendous influence on architectural discourse since the uh, basically early 90s. But at the same time, he's someone who say studied mathematics in uh, basically right after high school. He has a degree in architecture, as well as um, in fact a um, degree in business studies in other words, he did postgraduate work both in philosophy, in fact, with Gilles Deleuze in Vincennes after his architectural degree, and most notably, as I just mentioned, he holds an MBA in high technology and worked for a number of years as a journalist specializing in issues of IT. Uh, I do know that he used to write for the magazine Expansion, and he told me uh, last May that he actually sat uh, as an advisor to the privatiz privat privatization board in France that actually dealt with the privatization of the, the French BT, if you like, France Telecom. So there is an incredible versatility uh, to Bernard Cash, not necessarily always very well known, um, that actually, I think, exemplifies a strong interest both in theory and the imperatives of basically industrial life. Lately, uh, and I mean by that the last three, four years, Bernard has seemingly kept a low profile in or let's say among architectural circles, and I insist, among architectural circles, because as he told me, he got on with the work and Objectile has never been busier. Additionally, he's been working on completing a dissertation um, on Vitruvius for the last two years, retreating, if you like, into uh, now uh, theory, uh, part of which I understand he will present uh, as a premi premium, if you like, tonight to this audience. Um, the book uh, should be completed within a year and will be his, uh, if you like, main sort of foray into uh, basically these issues of, let's say, how history basically weighs on, on the present. Um, it is with great pleasure that I uh, would like to uh, welcome Bernard to the AA tonight. of presentation I will do tonight uh, will have s several parts. Uh, I, I will first uh, briefly show you some of the projects that we do on a daily basis in uh, our factory because uh, the big difference which 
in the way we practice architecture and uh, usual uh, architecture practice is that we have our own uh, unit of uh, manufacture. And uh, then I will show you a quick demo of uh, what is called uh, architectural and geometrical components uh, in the environment of uh, Missler Software, uh, a company I'm working with uh, in very tight connection uh, since uh, by uh, next week, actually, uh, I'm entering into a fourth month period where I will only uh, focus on the launch of the new kernel of uh, Missler Software, uh, which is due in April. Small le micro, peut-être, je sais pas. Je vais le micro de meilleur. Sorry. How do you turn the mic? I can speak louder if, okay, if, if, if needed. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, that'd be great. Sorry, just to be working. Okay, so so that's one of my uh, last day free uh, to show you uh, also the result of work on Vitruvius. Uh, so Georges told me that uh, perhaps not everybody would know his name here, uh, but Vitruvius. So is the first. Uh, is the first writer of a treaty of architecture that we have from antiquity in the Occidental tradition. Uh, so it's a book uh, which has become hard to read, uh, partly because of the book itself, uh, which entails actually many silence. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, reading Vitruvius is mainly interpreting silence, uh, and partly also due to the fact that for some reason uh, we have come disconnected to history and antiquity. Uh, so uh, let's start with what we are doing, what is our business on uh, a daily basis. And here you can see uh, first project, which is the ceiling of a theater uh, in the south of France. Uh, so it was a complex surface that was uh, calculated uh, by a series of mathematical uh, techniques. Uh, this is an exceptional object uh, because most of the time we work on an industrial basis. And here you can see uh, decorative panels uh, that we produce uh, something like uh, hundreds uh, every month and distribute in uh, several countries. Uh, beside that, we, we still collaborate with uh, other uh, architects, like for instance here, uh, those balcony for a series of uh, social housing uh, in Paris. <coughs> and here you can see uh, a series of boxes uh, which could be used for any type of purposes. Uh, what is important is that the one uh, above and the one below come from the same uh, file. Uh, so uh, here you can see all the technical details and what I will now show you is how we generate the panels and manufacture them. So here you have the, the only file behind all of these uh, boxes. You can see that I can manipulate it uh, nearly the way I want. And now I will generate, uh, this is just a symbolic representation, and I will generate uh, the elements uh, in front of you in real time. <coughs> so in order to do that, uh, I go into a library and uh, I pick up a component that is uh, a set of relation uh, that we'll have now to comply with the geometrical situation where I want to insert the panel. So I have a series of points to show that are actually the hypothesis behind the file 
that will recalculate all the relation needed to produce the geometry of this component. So if I made no mistake, uh, in a couple of uh, seconds, you will have, here it is, the panel appearing. And uh, if you see here all the elements, and if I'm uh, zooming here on all of this, uh, you will see that all the technical details are there and ready uh, to be produced. So uh, just to tell you to, to, to draw that takes at least, uh, I would say, two days uh, because all the technical constraints are respected. And now we have to manufacture it. Uh, so in order to do that, I just have to show the component. And then uh, the model will generate the machining program, take each of the parts of the panel and put them on the table of the machine and gener generate uh, the trajectory of the tool. So there it is. Uh, so here you can see all of the operations that have to be done. And uh, the last thing I have to do is uh, to ask to write the G code. Uh, so that's here. There it is. And if I go into uh, the file here, so you can see that the number, uh, the, the file itself has been named automatically, so you can see it here, and I can open here the file, and have, here you have the G-code. So I could come back to the, the initial hypothesis, modify the geometry, that will modify the components, modify the, the machining program, and modify in the end the G-code. So this is what we call uh, non-standard uh, uh, computer-aided and manufacturing design. And uh, this is really the thing onto which I focus. I think if there is something which is common to all of my activities, this is really the case. So uh, because we are uh, a company, we have to be efficient. And uh, all of this is tested and improved day after day. And uh, in relation with Missler Software, which is a company that makes uh, this type of uh, software, uh, it's a company which is uh, a competitor to Ketia in France because we have two uh, software publishers in France in the field of CatCam. So Ketia is very well known uh, because it's supported by IBM and uh, the French Ministry of Defense. Uh, but uh, Missler, actually, when it comes to manufacture the parts that are embedded in, for instance, uh, Airbus or Renault, uh, most of the subcontractor would use Missler rather than Ketia, uh, if only for one important reason, which is the price. Uh, so uh, now I leave my advertising. Part. <laughs> and uh, I'm closing all of that, otherwise it will slow down everything. Okay, and uh, we can now enter into another type of uh, computatio, mm -hmm. which was uh, actually the Latin name for computer, uh, which is uh, Vitruvius computatio. So uh, I will uh, well, the only aim of my lecture is to motivate you to, to read Vitruvius and to understand that uh, you can, I would say, manufacture your own tradition of architecture uh, by looking within this text at uh, parts that are most of the time uh, not commented by architects, but rather by historians of science. Uh, whereas actually they are now the core of our business uh, in the digital age of architecture. So I will <coughs> not have to go that far in uh, the, the, the architecture. Uh, I will start by the very first building mentioned by Vitruvius, 
which is the Tower of the Winds in Athens. Uh, actually, Vitruvius says very little about the building in book one, where he introduced the building. Uh, the, the main thing he mentioned is what you cannot see in the picture, uh, which is uh, the weather vane uh, that was indicating the direction of the winds, uh, which means that there was a triton uh, of bronze uh, holding uh, a, rod, a, a rod, uh, and the direction of the rod uh, would come above uh, those reliefs that you can see here, which uh, personifies the name of the eight main winds uh, in Athens. So, uh, this building is actually one of the best preserved buildings of antiquity, uh, because most of the building that we can see from antiquity uh, can be in better shape than this Tower of the Wind, but actually they were remade. Whereas this one remains as it were, uh, with uh, hardly no modification. Uh, so in order to understand this building on which, on which we do not see very much, uh, we have just one other text, which is a text written by Vero, uh, a kind of encyclopedist uh, that lived just before Vitruvius. Uh, actually, he died probably the year when Vitruvius published his own De Architectura. And uh, Vero uh, mentions uh, the Tower of the Winds because he said uh, that in his own property, he had built something very similar to what he called not the Tower of the Wind, but the Horologius of Andronikos de Kiros which was the name of the architect who designed this building. And so if you read uh, the text of Vero, uh, first of all, you discover a very interesting uh, place where he used to receive uh, his guests. So you can see here that uh, you have uh, behind the networks and of columns surrounding uh, the circular space, you had singing birds, then lying on a kind of a banquet, you had the guest, and in the middle you had a pool with uh, ducks swimming, and above the ducks, uh, a kind of wheel onto which the meals were positioned, and the slave would have the wheel circulate between the guests in order that they pick up what they want uh, on the wheel. So, uh, more technically, uh, you can see here uh, at the top of the hemisphere here, uh, you can see a pointer which is actually, uh, which corresponds to the weather vane that was above the roof. Uh, so, you could see from inside what was the direction of the wind outside. and. Uh, the word used in Latin by Vero, uh, ut intus scire possis, in order to be informed from within. And what is important here is the verb uh, information, well, uh, relating to information, because actually the Tower of the Wind is a complex device, and there are several uh, parts of this building that we must comment in order to understand why this building come up first into this uh, treatise of architecture. Uh, so first of all, I told you that there is a weather vane together with a windrose diagram. It's not just by chance that I'm using the word diagram because the word diagram and the concept of diagram that is very well, uh, very much used nowadays by architecture theoretician and architects is actually commented by Vitruvius and comes from a theoretician of music uh, whose name is Aristoxens. Uh, it's very strange that uh, in many uh, theoretical discussion, people mention this notion of diagram but do not see that it was there from the very beginning of architecture theory and has 
had a very precise meaning that we will uh, comment later. So, uh, below the relief personifying the winds, there were eight planar sundials. Uh, actually, we can see, if you go to Athens, you can see very slight traces of the curves uh, onto which you could read, read uh, the time on each of the eight faces of the octagon. In addition to that, there was another sundial, much more complex, on the rear of the building. I don't know if you remember the picture here, but here you can see the remains uh, of something that could look like an apsid, but which is actually a water tank, a water tank for a hydraulic clock. Uh, because that was the main device that was within the building. So uh, in technical terms, this, this was called an anaphoric clock. And if now you consider uh, actually the way Vitruvius describes the geometrical construction, uh, and actually there are very few uh, geometric construction commented into Vitruvius the Architectura, so if there is this one, which is actually repeated twice, uh, uh, it is that it is important. You know, th there was an idea from Vitruvius uh, in uh, uh, commenting this construction. So let's go through all of this uh, uh, device. Because first of all, uh, if you have a, a weather vane, you must have winds. So Vitruvius is developing a theory of the formation of the winds uh, and it's a mechanical theory. Uh, Vitruvius spent actually most of his time building machines rather than buildings. Uh, actually, war machines, catapults and ballistas. So he was an expert at building machines. I, I, in a way, you know, uh, m many people ask me, but you're an architect and you, you never build a building. Say well, just like Vitruvius, he. The, there is only one building we know of him, which is the Basilica of uh, Fanum. Uh, but most of his time was spent either in building machines or in organizing the water supply of Roma. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, we have no picture within the De Architectura. And actually, on the formation of the wind, uh, Vitruvius doesn't mention any picture, but uh, mention a device by which you had uh, here in a kind of uh, sphere, you had some water which, were, which was warmed from below. And when it was boiling, uh, the pressure uh, would make th the vapor flown out of the device and create a kind of uh, artificial wind. Uh, the picture I'm showing to you of this mechanism that was called the Eolipil is actually from Descartes. I'm insisting on that because if you read uh, uh, the Discours de la méthode from Descartes, which is a text that you have probably heard of at least, you must remember that uh, the Discours de la méthode is only the introduction of a series of three essays. The first one dealing with optics, the second one with what is called meteorology, and so formation of winds, uh, formation of clouds, and so on, and then geometry. And uh, at the end of the part on optics, uh, Descartes is very clear. I have written that because I want to be able to build the machine which enables me to produce uh, lenses that are of different shapes, uh, either elliptic or hyperbolic. So he is describing a numerical command machine. And this is uh, the real purpose of this discourse on method. Most of the commentary in philosophy uh, on Descartes uh, linger on the relation of uh, Descartes and metaphysics 
uh, they present him as an isolated uh, philosopher. Uh, you know, there is this image of uh, uh, Descartes remaining in a room during the whole winter of a uh, whole year, I don't know. Uh, just as if he was a philosopher, you know, thinking and doing nothing else. Whereas uh, uh, the discourse of methods is just an introduction to a method for building numerical command machines. And when it comes to explain natural phenomena, like for instance the formation of the winds, this is a picture that produced Descartes to explain it and uh, he doesn't mention Vitruvius because other people, most probably like, for instance, Heron in antiquity, were also uh, using those devices and commenting those devices. Uh, but there is a kind of filiation between Vitruvius, uh, his natural philosophy, his way of conceiving machines, and you will see also his way of conceiving of geometry as building curves via uh, mechanical device. So here you can see uh, one of the ver very first uh, geometrical device within uh, La Geometrie uh, from Descartes, which is a machine that enables you to trace hyperbolas. And uh, the machine is actually even more complex because you can change this part of the device that is here. I don't know if you see my pointer here. And then uh, build up other curves, like for instance, uh, the conchoid of uh, Nicomet that we will do on the computer uh, later. So uh, I'm just telling you that because when you read Vitruvius, uh, you think that what he's saying about the winds, uh, what he's saying about, for instance, uh, meteorology, uh, is something that is totally now outdated. Yes, of course. But uh, the same type of science remained up until the time of Descartes. So, you know, it's not because it's outdated now that what uh, Vitruvius wrote was not rational at that time, and did not remain rational for quite a long time because Vitruvius wrote, uh, well, the publication can be dated minus 27, whereas uh, Descartes wrote in 1638. Uh, so that's quite a, a lot of time. Uh, so uh, this is for the weather vane. Uh, now let's go to the sundials. So it's true that one of the difficulty in reading Vitruvius is that although he always claimed that he wants to uh, dedicate one book for such topic and another book for such topic and to isolate all the topics uh, and uh, compose them all together, uh, most of the time you have to circulate through the treaties in order, for instance, to understand that when Vitruvius, at the end uh, in book uh, nine, speaks of the sundials, most probably he's telling you something of about the Tower of the Winds. But he's not mentioning the tower anymore. So that, that, that's the difficulty. Uh, but once you start establishing all the relation within the book between the several parts, then I think you get a much clearer picture and you get an image of architecture in antiquity that is much closer to what we can think of uh, in our digital age. Uh, so for instance, let's see uh, what is Vitruvius' description of uh, uh, the mechanism for tracing a sundial. So you, you, you know that in antiquity, the basic device is you have a plane and you put, you put an upright rod on it. And this is called the gnomon. Uh, this is a Greek word which comes from a, a, a verb which says to know, to judge, to acquire knowledge. Uh, so in itself I would say it's an elementary device for knowing. It's nearly the, the beginning of the computer. 
because you will see that this, with this rod, you actually can start to build up a lot of interesting geometry and very efficient. So let's see that. Uh, Vitruvius describes that if you put on a representation plane uh, a sphere which represents the heavens at that time uh, with the equator here uh, that makes an angle which corresponds to the latitude of the place and here you have the, the, the tropics uh, then uh, by a simple falling down you can have uh, what in French we say a rabattement uh, of the trajectory of the sun and then uh, you can uh, simulate the trajectory well represent the trajectory of the sun as being a cone from the trajectory of the sun and each beam converging toward the end of the gnomon. So this builds you a first, first cone. And then, since the beam continue that trajectory, uh, you build up a second cone. And uh, this is for one day of the year. So this is uh, for one extreme position. And you can build it for seven position. And then, if you intersect that, by uh, the plane of the solar sundial, uh, then you get a series of curves uh, which are actually conicals. So you must understand that on the Tower of the Winds, already for each sundial, you have a variable cone which produces a series of lines. In that case, there are hyperbolas. Uh, and, uh, modifying the angle of this plane, uh, you have a whole series of different hyperbolas. So you are right in the middle of the conception of non-standard device. It's not one hyperbola, it's a family of hyperbola, it's a series of hyperbola. And uh, uh, if you consider also that uh, you had at the rear of the building the the epsid I'm, I'm loading Sorry. so here uh, if you consider that you had on the water tank a curved surface uh, on this surface you had much more complex curves than the one you can have just on the solar plane so you have sundials that were made out of sphere, you have also some that were made out of uh, cylinders like that, and those curves are actually uh, 3D curves, rather complex. So all of this is not actually well explained by Vitruvius. Vitruvius limits himself to the principle of this construction. Uh, and it's up to you to be able to draw on your computer uh, the end of uh, uh, Vitruvius procedure in order to, to understand how it works. So what I'm hinting at is that the fact that uh, now with the computer, you have a new device in order to understand the architectural uh, treaties. Uh, I mean, it's pro most probably nowadays that we have computer that you can manipulate uh, the principle that uh, Vitruvius is only explaining, concentrating until the end. And I think that uh, this is a new approach of architecture history by which you practice the history rather than just read and, uh, you know, uh, learn by heart. Uh, there is really a practice of history that is doable uh, thanks to the computer. So this is all for the sun dials. And uh, uh, now these are the sun dials that are most probably built by Andronikos de Siros 
uh, and you can see that they are relying on projection on curved surfaces, rather complex, uh, with several sundial on the same device. Uh, so I remember you, that's the architect of uh, the Tower of the Wind. And here I just show you a real example of those uh, sundial, uh, which shows you uh, the complexity of the projection. So now the problem is uh, that Vitruvius is not mentioning any hyperbola, any ellipses. There is no connex in these treaties. Do those uh, well, from uh, at least year minus uh, 330, people knew the conicals uh, in several ways. Uh, that uh, there is a mystery, and I think uh, it's something that remains uh, to be investigated by a historian of science. It is that uh, most probably uh, they were able to conceive of a mechanical uh, enabling to construct the hyperbola without identifying them as hyperbola. And that's the same problem that we have in representation. You, you, you know the problem uh, that Panofsky is uh, mentioning, the fact that uh, uh, Panofsky speaks of uh, an antique perspective, uh, alluding to the fact that uh, uh, in the picture of uh, the mural picture of the period of Vitruvius, uh, the main line of uh, some of the images were converging by couple. Uh, so there is this idea of fishbone perspective within uh, Panofsky, but uh, this is probably a mistake. I mean, nowhere in antiquity we have the device of the visual cone to be intersected by the plane of representation. Uh, there is not that notion in the optics of Euclid. There is not that notion in any uh, later text. So most, of the, uh, most probably, uh, this convergence of the lines uh, in representation were more a kind of graphical device, you know, just a, a, a 2D truck, just as you can see, a video effect on television that changes with some mood at, uh, at some time, some fashion at some time, and, and so on. Uh, but th there was not uh, this uh, intersection of the visual cone by uh, uh, the plane of representation. So uh, now this is a plane of the Tower of the Wind, and here you can see that right in the middle, so it's not just an accessory, you had uh, uh, the big solar clocks. So there was a huge bronze disc that was rotating, and on this uh, disc you had lines enabling you not only to know the time, but also to know at what time would the sun rise uh, or such other planets. So it's a whole bunch of information that was gathered on this device. And you could ask me, but how was that uh, big disk uh, rotate? Uh, simply because you had devices uh, where the water tank that you can see here, for instance, pour its water here and then uh, a, a floater is uh, rising, and then you have a device that makes the big disk rotate. This sounds strange because we have a kind of uh, notion of antiquity not used to machine. But now we have uh, remnants of mechanism such as this one, which are exposed in Athens, uh, they are wheels with uh, 400 dents, uh, thickness 2 millimeters, and some of them have had to be replaced. Uh, so you can imagine to replace at that time uh, a 2 meter plate uh, with f a few dents. I think that was quite an advanced technology. Uh, so. 
if uh, uh, now you consider that uh, most probably those mechanical devices were turning at a regular pace, but uh, the problem was that at that time ours had a variable duration because uh, uh, the the day was so organized that you had w w whether it be winter or summer you had eight hours of day, eight hours of night, so the hours of the summer were longer than the hours of uh, the winter. So the problem is how you synchronize uh, a mechanism which is regular in order to measure a duration which is variable. We are right in the middle of a non-standard uh, device. You have to make vary the device. And for that you had two solutions. Either uh, make the water flow variable and for that you had uh, uh, devices like the one on the screen which is a wedge uh, which you can insert uh, uh, more or less tightly uh, in order to regulate the water flow or you can read the information on a network of curves that were themselves variables. So this is uh, really described by Vitruvius uh, in his book 9 about uh, gnomonics, which is the science of the sundials. Uh, so, if I come back to the general idea of the building, uh, this is a building, so in Latin you would call that edificatio. Uh, it's covered by nine so sundials, so it's gnomonica, the name of the science, uh, which you say, I think, in English, mnemonics. And then there is a huge machine within the building which provides uh, information. So it's edificatio, gnomonica, and machinatio. This is actually the second definition of architecture by Vitruvius. This building incarnates the second definition of architecture, according to Vitruvius. So this is a very concrete text. I mean, of course, when you read that, so it's written in old uh, Latin, and then the translation in English is probably old-fashioned too. But if you look to the real objects that are shown before your, uh, in front of your eyes, then you have the real incarnation of the definition of architecture. And uh, so this building being a mechanism is not actually what Le Corbusier would have said une machine à habiter, a machine for living, but actually a machine in order to inform the public. It's a, 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 a kind of computer. And uh, the big uh, uh, the, the big thing I discovered, uh, having a discussion with Toyo Ito, who made a famous project called the Tower of the Wind, is that uh, Toyo Ito was not even aware of the existence of the Tower of the Wind from Vitruvius, uh, well, uh, from Andr Andronikos de Siros, but commented by Vitruvius. Whereas the Tower of the Wind in Tokyo has actually the same purposes, indicating the direction of the wind, showing uh, the time. Uh, it's a piece of device at the scale of the city, just as was the Tower of the Wind of Vitruvius. Now, uh, we have to focus on how you would build the octagon. You know, you have the ground, and then the land surveyors come, and you have to to draw the foundation of the octagon. Uh, in order to do that, uh, Vitruvius tells you, well, it's very simple. You put your gnomon, uh, which is here symbolized by just this point, which is the center of this circle. So you put your gnomon here, and at any time in the morning, you just uh, note where is the shadow of the gnomon. So you note this point here, and then you trace a circle, and 
what do you have to do? Just wait. Wait because uh, uh, the shadow will follow an hyperbola, and so here it will be shorter than the radius of the circle, and at one time in the afternoon, this curve will cross a circle, and then you will have another point, and if then you join this point to this point, you get the direction est, uh, east west. So, simple device, you just have to wait. Uh, why is it so? Because the trajectory of the sun is symmetrical. So, the all uh, uh, this explanation is made to have you understand that when you read Vitruvius, some of the words uh, like symmetry what you would think of. And already a lot of historians of architecture have mentioned the fact that uh, symmetry in Vitruvius and symmetry even after in the Renaissance doesn't mean a modern symmetry, but means commensurability. Because in Greek, sum means with, together, and metria uh, means measure. So it's common measure, uh, symmetry. So it's a fact that you can establish a common measure in numbers. Uh, but uh, surpri surprisingly enough, the Greek, nor the Latin, had any word to say what is symmetrical. So most probably the word symmetry that will also convey the meaning of what we are calling nowadays symmetry, although it has never been conceptualized as such by mathematicians even like Euclid. So it's true that uh, uh, within Vitruvius, you have a network of signification that you must understand in order to, to really understand it. But by the time you understand it, then uh, you discover things that are very similar to what we practice nowadays. And in order to show you that, I will uh, skip to uh, a mechanical device that uh, Vitruvius is mentioning uh, which is the mesolabium of Eratosthenes. You can see it in, in, uh, as a real device here. And uh, I can have it work for you on my computer. Uh, so there it is. So you, you, you remember the, the, the picture here. It's basically a wooden frame. Uh, and on that, uh, they have been made here in Italy in out of plexiglass, so it's hard to see, but there are triangles that can be slided one on top of the other. And uh, the, the aim of this game is to have four points on the same lines, and you can see this line here, although the picture is, is very bad, but here you can see it much better here. So. In this case, uh, this segment uh, will give you uh, the root of this other segment, uh, the cubical root of this segment. Uh, so le le let me uh, show you. Uh, and, and why is it for? Is it, uh, it's first in order to calculate problems of duplication of cubes. Uh, which is one of the most important uh, Greek problems. So the problem is, uh, if I show you uh, this image in perspective, you see this cube, this other cube. This cube is a cube, uh, unitary cube. Uh, that means that its size has a length equal to one. And then you have to find out the length of the cube uh, whose volume is in a proportion to this one. So if this proportion is two, just as uh, what I will do <coughs> right now, so I will figure and put two, I will now calculate in front of you, together with this device, uh, the cubic root of number two. So in order to do that, 
uh, I will move first this triangle until G is on the violet line. And then I will move this other triangle until B is also on this line. And there you can see that this parameter, this parameter is now two, and this is the ratio between the, the volume of the first cube and the second one. So uh, what you have to understand is that uh, this device was invented by Eratosthen and in minus uh, 200 and uh, more or less. Uh, when Eratosthen describes it, he says, my device is much better than any other. So you had already a competition in the field of, competition, uh, of computation. Uh, it not only enables you to calculate one cubical root, but uh, many uh, proportional means by thousands, and the Greek word is, well, muria. Uh, so that means that it's not only a device that calculates, that makes one calculus, but that is able to make many calculations. And the type of, calcu of calculations can be changed uh, because the problem of a cubical root is equal to the problem of proportional means, but by inserting additional triangle, you could also uh, calculate other type of proportional mean. So you had really a kind of software device that you could change and that enabled you to make calculation uh, at the uh, speed of nowadays, but already at a time that was uh, much better than any uh, other calculation. So you would think that this is just uh, mathematical research, but not at all. This is done for practical purposes and uh, uh, especially in order to build war machines. Uh, you, you, you must understand that the war machines uh, at that time were not functioning like arcs by flexion, uh, but uh, were functioning thanks to springs that you can see here. Uh, I have a, a drawing here by torsion. So the fundamental device in this machine is this spring. And all of the pieces, all the components of the value of the diameter of the hole through which the spring is passed. So uh, from the very beginning in uh, book one of the Architectura, uh, Vitruvius says that uh, you have to organize a building on the base of uh, proportional relations. Uh, and of course, as architect, you just focus on the fact that uh, the diameter of the column of the temple is the important module, but Vitruvius gives us other examples, and especially these examples of the catapult of the spring is the element thanks to which you can calculate all of the dimension of the, the other parts of the machine. And this uh, diameter is precisely the result of uh, this uh, cubic root. The, the, the formula was actually uh, that the diameter was equal at 1.1 1 .1, uh, cubical root of the weight of the stones you wanted to project. So uh, you understand that uh, this issue was a key issue because you know uh, you must think of this machine as being a complex calculation done by a mechanical device on top of which you could generate all of the dimension of the other pieces. So to me, there is no mistake. This is really parametric device. Uh, I think that if you read carefully Vitruvius, uh, there is really the possibility of building up a tradition of architecture uh, which is coherent with the methods 
that we are using in our time. And uh, in order to convince you that uh, this is still working nowadays, I can show you uh, another method described by Vitruvius. Uh, and uh, you had classical answer to that who would say, well, these tones must be at one tone from the other, one tone from the next, and then half tone from, from, from the following. Uh, so you had kind of fixed proportions because uh, actually inter musical intervals are proportions of lengths of chords. Uh, but uh, Isaacson is well aware that uh, you had an infinity of solutions. Uh, the an infinity of organizing uh, the tetrachords continuously. So here you have uh, the solution that uh, he is organizing. So here the, the horizontal distance is from the fundamental note until the fourth here. And here you have the position of the two intermediate notes that you can see vary uh, according to this sinus curve that I have uh, symbolized as a straight line here. So it's a various, uh, a variable uh, phenomena that uh, Isaacson is trying to organize. But there is a big difference with us, which is that uh, facing a continuous phenomena, uh, Isaacson said, when you have two notes two tones that are too close one to the other, you, your ear doesn't uh, hear the difference. So uh, although you have an infinity of possibility, you must not uh, try to, uh, to, to establish intervals that are smaller than your threshold of perception. And the word used for that is pugnon in Greek, in, in, in Greek uh, which is exactly the word that Vitruvius is using in order to criticize uh, the rhythm of the colon columns that are too close one to the other. So you, you remember that in Vitruvius, this is a classical theory of the orders. Uh, so one of the main characteristics of this order is the rhythm of the columns in proportion to the height of those columns. So uh, Vitruvius criticized uh, the rhythm where the columns are, so, uh, are too close one to the other, and the name for this, this rhythm is pycnostil, based on pycnon, which is precisely uh, the notion that uh, elaborates Istoxen in order to, di to avoid to establish too close uh, intervals. So. Uh, we have a strange, a different kind of thinking uh, The continues because of course we are in antiquity and all that I have uh, wanted to, to convey to you is a kind of proximity but not at all an identity between antiquity and our time. I mean, uh, uh, although I have hinted more at the similitude, there remains a big difference between the way architecture and uh, philosophy and science was made at that time, but this shouldn't prevent us to build up a tradition because there are elements that were already used at that time that we can still use and most probably that we can better understand because I, I, I will end on, on these things which is that uh, strangely enough Vitruvius comments very little on the method of construction, how you, you build in concrete, uh, how you build up the vault. All of this, Vitruv says very little. If, if you compare his treatise with the one of Alberti, uh, you would immediately see the difference between the technical and construction knowledge uh, that is conveyed by the De Re Edificatoria from Alberti and the De Architectura from Vitruvius. But strangely enough, because Vitruvius is more focusing on proportional relations, and I should say parametric relations, because you've seen that they are variable uh, proportions, 
uh, in a way, he's much closer to us in terms of uh, construction device than is Alberti, which is commenting the way you build up a, f a wall and you, you do vaults and so on. You, you, you understand? So my, my perception is that uh, uh, it's not that history is a given. Uh, history takes a different meaning at different time uh, according to the modification of uh, our own environment. And uh, thanks to the computer, thanks to the fact that now we are building with machines uh, and that we have to build machines with parametrical relation, uh, I would say that Vitruvius is again uh, able to provide us with a tradition that is different from the architectural orders. Thank you. Okay, we'll uh, take some questions, hopefully. Thank you, Bernard. I wanted maybe to um, to open the floor uh, with actually a question or two that you have slightly preempted in the conclusion to this particular lecture, which really had to do with how, see how we actually, let's say, instrumentalize Vitruvius today. Um, I was quite taken by, let's say, this, let's say, this almost archaeological project that you're proposing, and I can see how, for instance, today the incredible sort of uh, intricacy of parametric software can help us, say, make sense of these incredibly ancient and powerful intuitions, which, as you explained, for instance, Vitruvius did, probably did not even complete himself or heated at them and then were somehow handed over across the centuries, if you like, to ourselves. So I can see somehow how software today can help us make sense of Vitruvius. But I was wondering, what about the converse? In other words, um, how would for instance, uh, plainly, Vitruvius help us build better software, if I could phrase it that, that basically. Uh, keeping in mind, for instance, that in that article that you wrote about uh, actually the Plifier Euclid, uh, you mentioned that they were uh, Canadian software designers at this uh, now defunct uh, company, SGDL, who yes. were actually reading the ARG, um, uh, sort of 16th century, 17th century text on projected geometry in order to build a new software kernel. So is there something, for instance, here in the Vitruvius that would actually work along the same lines and enable somehow the relationship to work both ways, from us to antiquity and back? Yes, so, so, so there, are, there are many aspects in, in this answer. F first of all, uh, history is not something which is, you know, which is ready to use uh, for drawing an architecture project. So it, it's much more the fact that uh, 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 I have a kind of critical stance toward the fact that, uh, again, uh, the newness of architecture seems to be its uh, main quality. Uh, and uh, I can refer, for instance, I, I have seen in the shelves of the library, uh, there is Rosenberg here, uh, the tradition of the new, and all, all of this text. So I, I, I think. Uh, I, I took a critical sense towards uh, what I would call a kind of new avant-garde nowadays, a digital avant-garde, um, which is uh, creating a new state of amnesia, just as did the first avant-garde uh, during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, well, those people were very much helped by the fact that uh, uh, there were two world uh, World War, uh, which coincide with the architectural movement and which makes visible uh, a general tabula rasa uh, of uh, Europe. But, uh, and I'm afraid we, we might be at the verge of a new one. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, the city is really our inheritance, uh, our heritage is in itself uh, piling up several periods. And we have to take that into account. And uh, what I want the people who design, for instance, what seems to be the most outdated uh, paradigm of architecture, which is uh, the Greek temple, for instance. If those people were already thinking parametrically, perhaps the archi architecture is not 
totally outdated. Uh, and perhaps we have to think of an architecture uh, which is uh, in a way in connection to theirs. J just let's take uh, the, the, the notion of the, um, the atrium. Uh, the, the, the conception of the atrium by Vitruvius shows perfectly how you can build up a, tip, a typology of objects that are similar in a way and varying. So this notion of balance between uh, variation and invariant, which is actually at the very basis of the theory of geometry. Uh, this should be the topic of another lecture, but uh, uh, now, the architecture of geometry has been well structured by some, somebody like Felix Klein, Felix Klein uh, where uh, you study not any more figure, uh, but you study the, prop the properties that are left invariant by a certain type of transformation. So uh, there are certain properties, for instance, if you are in the geometry of the similitude, where the transformation is the homotasy, uh, the proportions are left invariant. This is the level of, gen of uh, geometry uh, that corresponds very well to the geometry of antiquity. So it's, no, it's not by chance that uh, Vitruvius is proposing us a treatise which is uh, uh, totally based on the notion of proportion. It's because proportion is the key notion of mathematical science in antiquity. Then comes this arg. Uh, and then at that time, uh, you, you know that a, a building represented in uh, uh, perspective has not any more the same proportion than the actual building. So there is a deformation of the proportion. But there still remains some invariance, which are, for instance, the fact that uh, lines that are crossing on a point still cross on a point and that uh, lines, uh, well, straight lines, remain straight lines. So those are the projective invariants. And then if you go further and you consider topology, you take the number of vertices, the number of ridges, the number of faces, for instance, of a regular polygon, you will find that they remain equal to two. So this is a, a basic theorem of topology. So as you can see, uh, the more mathematical knowledge and geometry advance, uh, the broader can be the, the transformation, uh, but keeping in mind that they still keep in variance a certain type of property, otherwise we have nothing to say about it. And uh, I think that uh, the paradigm that I'm trying to, to propose is the fact that uh, we have to do the same with history. We have to change because our problems are not the same uh, methods are not the same. Uh, this computer is not the meso mesolabium of Ratosten. But there remains something that is in a way invariant. And this, inv uh, this invariant can be a different type of scale. You, you can choose to have uh, the, less, uh, the least type of variation, which is the symmetry, for instance, uh, the Tower of the Winds, by its geometrical plan, is uh, only the repetition of equal length with equal angle. So then if you start deforming it, you can have a proportional building. Then you, if you deform it more, you have uh, uh, a projective building, and then you can go up to topological transformation. Uh, but I would say that Within a, a software, if I show you, for instance, uh, on those software, what is important is not that you s what you see on the screen. What is important is a symbolic tree, which is here. And if I'm editing that, these are the relations that remains invariant uh, through the transformation that I, I'm able to do manually here by uh, grabbing point here, which is this one. So all of this variation uh, keep some property invariant. So you were mentioning the fact of uh, making a software. Y yes, people thinking of software are thinking of methods which are exactly th those one. Uh, being able to deal with 
uh, have a freer variation by keeping some property invariance. Uh, it's true that with the computer you can do any type of building, any type of shape, and even manufacture it. So now there is no problem about that. But, uh, and there are places where it makes sense to build such building. But 99% uh, of buildings will remain cubicle. That's for sure. <laughs> and, and, and you have to, to find a kind of continuity between the 99% of the average building and the crazy uh, uh that you will have uh, in the center of the city. Uh, I, I think that to be able to think and, and to bridge a gap between these two types of architecture and uh, making it feasible at an affordable price is really uh, the issue that is important in architecture. It's a crazy building, crazy algorithm. That's done. I mean, uh, and, and you know, the architects are. You mentioned the, uh, the tonal qualities of sound, um, which is particularly interesting to what I have been doing. I just wanted to know whether you thought in your own mind whether this approach to um, uh, doing architecture might actually um, result in a building that is more natural and therefore um, more uh, harmonious with the earth in general. Um, is, do you have any of that feeling while you're doing this work? No. An artificial, because I definitely had the feeling in one or two of your diagrams that they responded to um, a, a natural order of their own, which would equate with other natural orders that we don't actually discuss, but a lot of people think exist. I, I was just thinking of a quality. I wasn't thinking of um, uh, the, the context. I was thinking of an added quality that could be provided by this approach. Um, we will have to sort of gradually conclude, although since you haven't really been here since 1999, we, we feel that you know, we, we're very happy to have you and then we want to pin you down with a number of questions. If I can just uh, phrase the last one for me, I was quite taken by, um, let's say, actually it's a question that comes out a little bit out of your own comparison between your laptop and the mesolabium, uh, a question about machines yes. and how you've been showing us a number of mechanical contraptions and every time suggesting that you know they are already information, uh, they are already uh, computers in some ways and I understand that you focus on relations but I wanted to ask you the following question. Nowadays we sort of have two kinds of machines. We have analog ones and digital ones. Um, digital radios, analog radios and stuff. For instance in my own printer at the office we have let's say basically a printer which has a plot server which always works great and then it's got all these mechanical arms that keep breaking down and give me the feeling that there's two machines in one somehow. And I wanted to ask you the following questions, whether you feel that this distinction somehow is, is in any way material to your argument or can it be somehow, is it important, can it be brought to bear on the way you, let's say, interpret um, those early mechanical devices and call them computers basically? Well, if, if I were speaking in science, I, I would not present it this way. I would immediately uh, make clear that those were kind of analog computers as opposed to uh, discrete computers uh, or digital uh, computers. Although what I said before uh, about the fact that uh, a continuous phenomena like sound 
uh, is in fact discretized by Aristoxen makes it in the end much closer uh, to a digital uh, computer. And I, I, I think the, the theory of Aristoxen and its use by Vitruvius are really interesting. And I, I, I have started to discuss it with historians uh, of science, and they have no concept to describe uh, this type of uh, thinking of the c continuous. Uh, but, but it's true that we, uh, again, I insisted on the similitude in order to have you uh, be interested uh, by reading Vitruvius, by showing that what are the similitudes, but immediately then uh, in front of uh, people who know already that, uh, then you would discuss the differences. That's for sure. Uh, I, I, I'm always uh, r r reminding that uh, you, you, you know the anecdote of Vitruvius about the Corinthian capitals. Uh, the, the, the story is that a young sculptor was walking and uh, saw a kind of basket that, that was uh, on top of uh, Acanthus roots. And then uh, it was left there uh, on the tomb of uh, a young girl, and, and, and then the, the roots grown and had the, uh, the leaves uh, surround the basket. And this gives the image of the Corinthian capital. Okay? Uh, the, the words of Vitruvius are, uh, by chance, a basket was left on the roots. And I think what is very interesting in this image is that uh, you have an object this, that is foreign to the roots, that has been left by chance, and the tradition has been naturalized. In this case, in, in this the word naturalized. I mean, tradition is a construction. It's an artificial thing uh, that doesn't uh, cancel the fact that this basket was left by chance. There is no reason why <laughs> this basket was on this route. And uh, the, the gap between the basket and the route has been masked by the leaves that are growing around the basket. And I think this is a good image of the way we have to build a tradition, which is that uh, we must not tend to make a kind of ideology saying that we are still living in the same type of uh, uh, way of thinking and so on. But uh, there remains a gap. There is perhaps no reason why these elements remain from the past uh, have been left, but we still have to connect them together. Uh, I think tradition does not mean necessarily uh, to think that you have a kind of natural uh, growing process and that, you know, a kind of vision of history as monolithic uh, by chance. There was a root, there was a basket, it was left upon it. And then the leaves uh, wrapped the basket and made it a kind of shape belonging to the tradition of architecture. In um, and these very optimistic words I would like to basically call the session to a close. Bernard, um, all I can say is that you're, you're actually your mix of history, your faith in history, your technical expertise, your optimism uh, are incredibly inspiring, um, especially in this context of boundless enthusiasm for the, just, let's say, the visible part of the iceberg. So in that sense, I would like to thank you very, very much for having given this extensive lecture tonight, and I hope we see you sooner the next time around. Thank you. Thank you.